it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara. She's an Associate Professor of Social and Cultural History at the University of Durham, specialising in the 18th century with a particular interest in the history of Newcastle upon time. She's published on Anne Fisher's life in Newcastle in her monograph, Age Relations and Cultural Change in 18th Century England. And she's also co-authored with Adrian Green, a collection of essays entitled Economy and Culture in Northeast England, 1500 to 1800. And she's written extensively on the region's print, trade and ballad culture. Today I want to talk to you about the working life of Anne Fisher, exploring the various stages of her remarkable career. And to do so, I think also shines a light on the experiences of women more generally, exposing some of the reasons why evidence of their lives often slips through the gaps in the archives. So Fisher herself began her working life as a school teacher and an author of educational books before going on to, rather, to run a successful printing business alongside her husband, Thomas Slack. When she died in 1778, it was said in a letter of condolence to her husband that the literary public had lost one of its highest female ornaments. Not only would her distinguished character be viewed and held sacred, by all the sons and daughters of science, but she would be respectfully mentioned to all succeeding generations. Yet despite this enthusiastic eulogy, her name, along with the memory of her achievements, um, has, <coughs> excuse me, um, has faded into relative obscurity. Her success as an author, an educationalist, has received some limited attention over the years. But until relatively recently, her involvement in the Prince trade has either been forgotten or reduced to that of an able assistant in her husband's business. In what follows, I want to move beyond descriptions of Fisher that have labelled her as a yeoman's daughter from Cumbria or a printer's wife from Newcastle. Clearly she was both of these things. But here I want to present her in her own right as an innovative <coughs> educationalist and a very successful entrepreneur. I'll begin by exploring her achievements prior to marriage, before considering the practicalities of being a working wife and mother and the ways in which her gender shaped her career. And finally, I'll turn attention to the various ways that she contributed to the business that she ran alongside her husband. As you'll see, in many respects, Fisher was an exceptional woman, but her life nevertheless provides a valuable insight into the experiences of working women at this time, exposing why theirs is so often hidden labor and highlighting the importance of the life cycle in relation to female employment. Now, before all of this, I think it would be quite helpful to think about the print trade more generally. Convention has it, that the 18th century print trade was dominated by men. And for sure, this is true, but it's an assumption that colors the interpretation of the evidence in ways that obscures the contribution of women. To give just one simple example, if a printer uses an initial rather than their forename, the assumption is that they're male, unless there's um, explicit evidence to the contrary. Again, an unnamed workforce in a printer's workshop are simply assumed to be men. And yet, as Marie Kennedy has pointed out, it's possible to find women, images of women working in print shops, even if such women have left little specific evidence to identify them. So Fisher was certainly not unique as a woman in the print trade, not even in Newcastle. But women who have been recognized as printers are usually only acknowledged as such in widowhood. So for instance, if we look at Richard Welford's account of early Newcastle typography, which covers the period up to 1800, the only woman included in his list of 29 Newcastle printers was Margaret Angus. Um, she was active in the later 18th century. And even here, Despite the successful career of Margaret, she doesn't get an entry in her own right. Instead, Welford 
includes her alongside her husband in a joint entry. Welford, moreover, seemingly assumes that Margaret only became involved in the print business after her husband had died, running the press in her own name, and then in partnership with one of her sons once he came of age. And Fisher did make an appearance in Welford's list of printers, but only in her side in her husband's entry. Um, so again, he sort of he admits that she was an accomplished woman. He describes her as a compiler of educational work um, under the pen name A. Fisher. Um, he did even concede that the slacks worked together and often cooperated on some of their output. But the printing business was unequivocally presented as her husband's venture. So there was one other woman who um, warranted a list, uh, a mention in Welford's list, this being Sarah Hodgson, the daughter of Anne Fisher and Thomas Slack. And again, like Margaret Angus, Sarah was said to have taken over her late husband's business. And again, she was not listed as a printer, but only referred to in her husband's entry. It's surely implausible to assume that Margaret Angus and Sarah Hodgson were ignorant of their trade prior to widowhood. Nevertheless, any contribution they made um, <coughs> whilst they were wives has gone unrecorded and unacknowledged. This is in large part because of the subordinate status, legal status of married women. The laws of coverture meant that, excuse me, the laws of coverture meant that married women's property was passed into the hands of their husbands when they were married, including any future earnings. And in theory, at least, um, women couldn't, married women could not enter into a contract in their own right. Now, we shouldn't assume that this meant that married women simply became their husband's property. And in truth, we find a yawning gulf between law and lived reality. Even so, the legal status of wives means that so much of their married life was conducted in their husband's name. Therefore, if a woman died before her husband, as Anne Fisher did, they often slipped through the gaps in the archive. Fortunately, in the case of Fisher, she left just enough evidence to piece together an account of her working life. And as a consequence, her experiences help us to understand the lives of women like Margaret Angus and Sarah Hodgson prior to widowhood. Relatively little is known of Anne Fisher and um, uh, her early life, beyond the fact that she was born in 1719 in the hamlet of Oldscale, not far from Lawton in Cumberland, and her father was a yeoman farmer. By the age of 26, she'd relocated to Newcastle. And it's here that the earliest traces of her working life can be found, beginning with the publication of her first and most successful book, A New Grammar, in 1745. This grammar was repeatedly reprinted in both Newcastle and London, running to more than 30 editions. Only three grammars published during the 18th century spawned more editions than hers. This was a significant intervention in a male-dominated sphere. Yet this achievement has, re has received little attention outside of the field of linguistics. And as will become apparent, one of the reasons for this was clearly her gender. There are unfortunately no known copies of the first edition of a new grammar. So if anyone knows of one lurking around an attic, now's the time to say. Um, all that remains are the newspaper advertisements, um, the first of which appeared in the Newcastle Journal in March 1745. There was no mention of an author in these early advertisements, but at least some of the second and third editions were advertised as 
by the author of The Child's Christian Education, who was a man named Daniel Fisher. And the title pages of some of these early imprints are credited to D. Fisher and others. Daniel Fisher was, at this time, the schoolmaster in Wickham, just outside of Newcastle. And it's not unlikely that Anne and Daniel were related. They would certainly have known each other prior to Anne's relocation to Newcastle, as Daniel had been appointed curate of Wythart Chapel on being ordained in 1738, which was just a few hundred yards across the fields from where Anne was born. There's been some debate in the field of linguistics about whether Daniel actually contributed to the new grammar. But Maria Red uh, Esther Rodriguez Gill undertook a careful comparison of the grammar and other publications by both Anne and Daniel, evaluating the content and the linguistic style. And she concluded the grammar was Anne's work. And if Daniel had made any contribution at all, these were extremely minimal. So we have to ask what motivated the decision to link the new grammar to Daniel. And I think this was probably twofold. Firstly, he was already a successful author of children's educational books, making this a sensible marketing strategy. Secondly, and possibly more importantly, this allowed Anne to conceal her name and significantly her gender, not simply from the public, but also from her publisher. She was, after all, encroaching upon a very male genre. Grammar was not considered a particularly suitable subject for girls to learn. So for a woman to devise a new grammar was without question breaching the boundaries of gender expectations. Fisher's desire for anonymity was confer confirmed if we look at the differing attributions in two surviving imprints of the third edition. The first, seen here, was published in Newcastle, where Anne might have been known. And, as already noted, it was credited to D. Fisher and others. Um, whilst an undated preface was signed D. Fisher. In contrast, the cover <coughs> of the imprint published in London, and I'm afraid I don't have a photograph of that, just a facsimile, um, and the, the, the London imprint boldly states by A. Fisher, and the preface was signed A. Fisher, November the 11th, 1749. So presumably this preface was also used in some earlier imprint. By 1754, even the Newcastle imprints were credited to A. Fisher and used the preface signed by her in 1749. However, by this time she was Mrs. Slack. So maybe publishing under her gender neutral um, maiden name made it a sufficient level of anonymity. <laughs> it's important to note that Fisher's grammar was a significant intervention in a highly contentious debate about correct English grammar. And yet this was not, her intervention was not explicitly recognized, um, even though it was plagiarized and her ideas were widely copied. Um, and I think this was at least in part because she was a woman, but it was also because hers was not a, a highbrow publication. It was designed for the down to earth environment of the classroom. And as such, it focused on teaching practice, not on the philosophy of language. And there was a very practical side to um, the work that Anne did. So in the 1749 preface, um, she claimed that any person of a tolerable capacity may, in a short time, we learned to write English independent of the knowledge of any other tongue. And that is properly and correctly as if for the press. Now this is notable for two reasons. 
Firstly, because Fisher used learned and not taught. The former was already regarded as obsolete by some in the 18th century. But maybe because of its etymological links to Northumbrian English, it can still be heard in spoken, if not written usage in the Northeast in some places today. And this serves to remind us that correct usage was still being debated. And it's actually not the only example of Fisher using Northern speech patterns. Secondly, this quote's significant because it demonstrates that Fisher already had an eye on the print trade, even if only as a sister occupation to that of authorship. Oh, it's quite a dark image. Um, so again, emphasizing the practical nature of our educational methods, a new grammar was advertised as the most easy guide to speaking and writing English. And just three months after it was first published, this notice appeared alongside um, an announcement for a new girls' school at the end of Denton Chair. So actually just across the road from where we are tonight. And here Fisher was to teach English grammar alongside more traditional female subjects. And this brings us to the second strand of Fisher's career, that of putting her educational um, ideas into practice. So Anne advertised her school for a second time in 1750, when it moved to premises at St. Nicholas's churchyard. And in that notice, she made a detailed reference to the grammar that she taught, leaving no doubt that these lessons were based on her new grammar. Now, clearly it was an astute move to publish a grammar book that you used in your own school. And this dovetailing of entrepreneurial activity is something she continued to do throughout her career. Her school was, like her grammar, a notable departure from convention. Grammar had traditionally been taught in Latin and had been, for the most part, the preserve of older boys from more affluent ranks of society. Grammars written in English were initially designed to introduce these scholars of Latin to the concept of grammar in a language they understood. And Fisher was not alone in complaining that most of these were so dependent upon the Latin, they were only translations. They introduced superfluous cases, genders, moods, and tenses that added needless perplexities. The mid-century vernacular grammars, of which Fisher's was a forerunner, were said to be more practical for the scholar of English. But more than this, Fisher regularly questioned teaching methods prevalent in grammar schools. In particular, she disputed the value of rote learning. Training the memory had been central to a classical education, but Fisher argued that it was not the unmeaning repetition of rules, but application and practice that made them familiar. What's more, it was the former that made grammar so tedious a task that it required the liberal use of the rod to force a scholar submission to knowledge. But Fisher thought that this was, and I quote, a manifest absurdity to maintain or imagine that anyone could be awed into a love of, labor, a love of learning or virtue. Instead, she promoted the idea that education should, be aimed, should aim to be engaging and even entertaining so that children would want to learn. If we base this on the number of editions, reprints and pirated copies, we can assume that Fisher's grammar was hugely <laughs> successful. In trying to understand the extent of her um, influence in the classroom, beyond her own classroom, I looked at the schools advertising in, Newcastle, in the Newcastle Current, Journal and Chronicle, sampling every fifth year between 1730 and 1785. And these, were no these notices revealed a wealth of information 
about a wide range of schools that were introducing English grammar um, to their curriculums at this time, from girls boarding schools to boys grammar schools, and even to more elementary mixed sex writing schools. And some of these made it clear that it was Fisher's grammar they were introducing. So to offer just one example, in 1770, George Busby was running a school in Sunderland when he informed the readers of the Newcastle Chronicle that he was to offer evening classes to teach English grammar to those young ladies and gentlemen who could not attend during the day. He gave a clear indication of which grammar he would use, paraphrasing Fisher, as he suggested, it has been experienced in these parts, um, at these parts of the country, that any youth of a tolerable capacity who can read may in half a year be taught to write English as properly and correctly as if for the press. Going on to directly quote her critical comments about rural learning and to repeat her claim that scholars of English would find it easier to acquire the knowledge of another language. If we look at the schools that were run by women, and this suggests that Busby was right to emphasize Fisher's influence in the Northern Counties. When Susan Sked did a similar survey of advertising in Jackson's Oxford Journal, she noted that female teachers offered a highly restricted curriculum that was limited to practical skills such as needlework. Few taught reading and only one offered writing. Whereas the notices placed in Newcastle suggest a quite different picture. There were 33 advertisements from 21 different schools run by women during these years. And those that referred to their curriculum, sorry, of those that referred to their curriculum, 12 offered writing, nine of which also taught grammar. In fact, by 1770, even a governess might be expected to offer grammar. Um, for example, a young woman of about 21 uh, was seeking employment in a boarding school or private family. And she informed the readers of the Newcastle Chronicle that she'd been taught English in the new method of English grammar by an eminent teacher. So whoever had taught this woman, this young woman, and by whichever method of grammar she was using, it's possible to conclude that Fisher and the influence of her grammar led her out. She made it normal for girls to um, suddenly got an echo. She made it normal for girls to learn grammar um, and for school to teach it. And she provided she both provided aid, aid in doing so easy. All right. So if, Fisher, if Fisher's um, grammar had been an only achievement, I still think this would have made her a remarkable woman. But at this point, I want to turn to her married life and to think about what else she achieved um, and, and how her changed status affected her career. So Anne married just before Christmas in 1751. Her husband, Thomas Slack, was a printer by trade. And when they married, he was the manager of the print office at the head of the side, owned by Isaac Thompson, who happened to be the Newcastle publisher of Fisher's Grammar. It's therefore likely that Fisher's husband-to-be was directly involved in printing her grammar before they got married. Um, yet no, how, no matter how expedient it was to wed her printer, this was not simply a marriage of convenience. It was evidently a marriage of minds, and to all accounts, a happy and loving union. There was no further evidence of Fisher's school after she became Mrs. Slack, but she went on 
to publish several educational books under her maiden name. Maria Rodriguez Gill argues that Fisher's references to teaching experience in these later books suggest she may well have continued to teach him um, after she married. However, if a reproductive labour is taken into account, it's hard to imagine how this could have been feasible. Despite the fact that Anne was 32 when she married, the Slacks had a large brood of nine children, all daughters, six of whom survived to adulthood. They baptised their first child, Mary, on the 7th of December, 1752. So just 12 months after they married. And Anne went on giving birth every three, sorry, every one to three years for the following 16 years. Baptising her last, last child, Margaret, in June of 1768, just nine days after Margaret's namesake had died at 19 months of age. And by this time, Anne was 48. Evidently, it was not simply convention that meant that Anne was likely to have stopped teaching when she married. By the time she celebrated her fourth wedding anniversary, she already had three young daughters. Surely she was not still running a school at this time. And it's more likely that any continuing hands on experience she had of teaching came from taking control of her daughter's education. Now we can see that writing would have been a more flexible occupation than running a school, making it possible to fit this work in around her other commitments. Nonetheless, it wasn't until 1756 that Anne published her second book, A Pleasing Instructor. And the following year, the fifth edition of the new grammar appeared, enlarged with a new appendix. And this output corresponds with the first extended gap in live births since Anne married. And so between 50, 1755 and 1758. Although it's um, not to say that she wasn't actually pregnant during these three years, because miscarriage was not uncommon. <laughs> and then in 1762, after a two year gap in live births, Anne published the seventh significantly enlarged edition of the grammar. And this was also the year that the new English tutor first appeared in print. And this was just after daughter number six was born, Frances. Her other daughters at this time would have been 10, 8, 7, 4, and 2. So she had fewer infants to care for, but she was presumably providing homeschooling for the older girls. And then her three youngest children were baptised in 1764, 66, and 68. And these years coincided with a break in her educational publications. Yet, as we'll see, this was quite a busy time for her and her husband. It also should be remembered that the Slacks suffered bereavement at this time um, because two of their youngest daughters died in infancy and this surely took a toll on the family. However, in practical terms, it meant that when Anne published a flurry of new books in the early 1770s, she had no children under six. And by this time, some of her daughters were old enough to be used as guinea pigs for these new books prior to them being published, thereby combining her domestic commitments with her work output. Now, historians, historians who've looked at poverty are well aware that the life cycle matters in terms of um, the impact on um, household economies. However, um, less attention has been given to the life cycle patterns of wealthier working women, beyond maybe the impact of marriage and widowhood. Yet, as Fisher demonstrates, even for comfortably off women, the realities of childbirth impacted upon their career, and there were important transitions in family composition between marriage and the menopause. So for Fisher, 
writing educational books was something that could be done around and even as part of being a mother. Her grammar was most unquestionably the most successful book, but others ran to multiple imprints. Um, and she also produced the Ladies' Own Memorandum book beginning in 1764, the year daughter number seven was born. This was an annual publication that combined a diary with a magazine. It was based on a popular format and stood out as distinct from her other publications. This was evidently a successful venture and was carried on until 1805, at which point it was being produced by daughter number five, Sarah. In its heyday, it was said to have sold a thousand copies a year. No, that Dan wasn't the only author in the family. Her husband also produced a memorandum book that survived in annual publication um, for an astonishing length of time from 1755 to 1893. And in addition, he also published several tradesmen's guides under the pen name S. Thomas. And these were evidently profitable, if not as successful as his wife's books. Peter Isaac concluded that Anne probably supported her husband in this authorship. And at the very least, it can be assumed that her experience as a successful author of educational books had encouraged him to produce his tradesman's guild guides. Clearly then, the Slacks were a versatile couple who knew how to turn a profit. And this brings us to the third strand of Anne's career as a partner in the family printing business. And it's here that her working life becomes quite difficult to determine. It was in April, 1763, that the Slack's printing office from bookshop, known as the Printing Press, opened for business. It was situated in the bustling center of the town at the bottom of the big market, opposite Highbridge with the premises variously described as being at the head of Middle Street or on Union Street. The shop gained a reputation as a meeting place for writers, artists, actors, and those involved in local politics. In effect, it was a literary club or cultural venue. And it's important, I think, to consider that Newcastle was at this time, one of the most important printing centers outside of London. And so the slacks were not simply filling a gap in the market. They were carv carving out a successful business in a highly competitive environment. There has, you might not be surprised to hear, um, been a tendency to assume that Thomas Slack established this printing business. Even Isaac Thompson, sorry, even Peter Isaac, who recognized Anne had worked alongside her husband suggested the business belonged to Thomas and that he was ably assisted by his wife. And despite emphasizing Fisher's achievements, he still assumed that she simply contributed to her husband's business. By contrast, Fisher's role in Slack and Co was much more readily recognized in an article from the Monthly Chronicle in May, 1890. Here, the printing press was described as their business, not his. And the readers were told that the couple were not merely printers and booksellers, but bookmakers and journalists as well. Writing in 1720, sorry, writing in 1921, James, Hodge, James Hodgson, a descendant of the Slacks, examined letters exchanged between Fisher and the local poet, John Cunningham in which she clearly demonstrated her involvement in the technical process of book production in its entirety, even discussing how long the paper would take to dry before it could be bound. As Helen Williams has recently noted, for she was clearly involved in and understood her business. In other words, she was not simply an assistant, but an active partner and there was no doubt that she was involved in the success of the, of the printing press, engaged in making deals 
organising sales and using her contacts to promote publications. However, I think despite all this being true, I think it needs to be put in the perspective of what we already know about Anne's working life. After all, in 1763, the Slacks had six daughters, aged one, three, five, eight, nine, and 10. And three more were born in 64, 66, and 68. Therefore, like other aspects of Anne's career, it seems likely that she became more involved in the printing press after her surviving children grew older. Now, of her physical presence in the day-to-day -day output um, of the early years of the printing press was reduced by her domestic commitments, we need to ask what, in what other ways she might have contributed. Um, <coughs> and in this final section, I want to focus on this question, concentrating on her entrepreneurial, financial and intellectual input. So firstly, if we compare the Slack's working lives before the printing press, it's possible to argue she was the more entrepreneurial. She had, after all, authored a successful grammar book and was using it in her own school at the time that she married, while her husband, well, her husband-to-be, was an employee. Now, as early as 1755, Thomas Slack began to appear Thomas Slack's name began to appear on a few publications, starting with his own memorandum book. But much of what was printed for Thomas Slack prior to 1763 was in fact books written by Anne. And taking control of the production of her Newcastle print runs meant that they maximized their profits from her work. And money was of course needed to invest in a print run, let alone in opening a print shop, which begs the question, where did their working capital come from? Without an account book, we can't be sure, but it seems likely, but if it seems likely, they were relying it on profits from publications to reinvest, then Fisher's contributions were surely significant. Notably, when Thomas author began authoring books, in 1759, he always printed in London with a London with a named London seller, um, as well as Slack in Newcastle. So sharing the risk and any profits. Conversely, Anne's books regularly appeared in two separate print runs, one in London and one in Newcastle. So for instance, two versions of the first edition of The Pleasing Instructor were produced in 1756. One for Hitch and Horse in Paternoster Row and the other for T. Slack in Newcastle. The Slacks were evidently confident of sufficient sales of Anne's books locally to make this arrangement financially viable. And this proved a correct assumption in this case, as the second edition of The Pleasing Instructor was published in Newcastle less than 12 months after the first appeared in print. So by the time they opened the printing press in 1763, Thomas had produced eight editions of his almanac plus, plus single editions of two books, whereas Anne had a total of 11 book editions to her name. And when she died, um, this increased to a total of 33 editions of various books, plus the lady's own memorandum. So at the very least, I think it's fair to say that Fisher contributed considerably to the family finances. In addition to her entrepreneurial spirit and her financial impulse, Anne's intellectual contribution, I think is of key importance. So the underlying rationale that drove Anne's work is most clearly seen in her educational output. She had a long a career long interest in promoting a method of education designed to be engaging and rewarding so as to nurture a love of learning. This aim is most clearly seen 
in the pleasing instructor um, or entertaining moralist. And where the type in itself is an unambiguous declaration of her intent. When this book was advertised in the journal in 1760, the reader was told, morality here appears gay and smiling, steals insensibly into our good graces and makes the most lasting impression being divested of the unpleasing formality to which she is too often um, disguised by partial or mistaken pedants. This was not simply a marketing stance, as um, could be said for some of her competitors. Fisher's educational methods provided an underpinning for all of her publications. It was this desire to entertain while she informed that made her book so popular. This approach was possibly her most important contribution to the success of the printing business. And as is clearly seen in the most significant venture undertaken by Slacking Pro, that being the founding of the Newcastle Chronicle. So the first edition of the Chronicle was published on the 24th of March, 1764, just less than a year after the printing press opened for business. The newspaper was of central importance to their business endeavors, not simply providing a weekly income from newspaper sales and, and advertising revenue, but also a vehicle for promoting products available in their shop and a distribution network that could be used to both collect orders and deliver goods alongside the newspaper. And predictably, I think, according to Richard Welford, it was Thomas Slack who was the founder and printer of the Chronicle. And nonetheless, he conceded that Mr. and Mrs. Slack probably cooperated on the newspaper. Now, in fact, Anne's stamp was evident from the outset and their intellectual stance was patently clear in a promotional flyer for the Chronicle, which included a paragraph that was specifically targeted at female readers, assuring the ladies that the paper would not just report on political and business news, but would also contain polite literature alongside subjects tending to their edification and amusement. This was a joint venture, um, and this could not be more explicit. Anne was not helping her husband with his newspaper. They were working together to maximize their pot potential readership. It's interesting that the Chronicle was established just months after um, Anne's Ladies' Own Memorandum book first appeared in print. Um, and there were notable similarities in the content of the memorandum book and the aspects of the Chronicle aimed to attract a female audience. And so here we can see another case of Anne's um, dovetailing her project and her feminine touch could be said to be one of the things that gave the Chronicle a competitive edge against its more um, established rivals in the town. Now, as Helen Williams has noted, the Ladies' Own Memorandum book is unique in being the only book of its kind produced by a woman for women during this period. And yet I think it's important to remember that it was only her memorandum book that was exclusively designed for the ladies. Their newspaper, like all of Fisher's educational work, was explicitly aimed at both sexes. In fact, maybe the only reason that her memorandum book was gender specific was so that it would complement her husband's equally successful Newcastle memorandum book. These publications were evidently not thought to be in competition, given that they were marketed alongside each other in the Chronicle. So in fact, I think rather counterintuitively, Fisher's only publication aimed exclusively at a female audience might have been the only example in her career where she was following in her husband's footsteps rather than paving the way. 
So Thomas outlived his husband, sorry, <laughs> Thomas outlived his wife by nearly six years. And dying in 1788, 1784. Oh, um, and in his will, it was um, daughter number five, Sarah, to whom he left the premises where the printing business had been birthed. And yet she did not become the owner of the printing press at this time. <laughs> Instead, the, um, the week following, a week following the announcement of Thomas Lack's death, after a long illness, and without any notice of the sale, a chap called Solomon Hodgson informed the readers of the Newcastle Chronicle of his purchase of the newspaper. So Hodgson, Hodgson who had been working for the Slacks um, in their printing office for at least six years, and was in fact a witness on Slack's will, um, um, seems likely to have been running the Chronicle during Slack's long illness. Then, um, and then um, took over the newspaper the following week. And then a year after Thomas Slack died, Solomon Hodgson married Sarah Slack. And it was then um, that the executors of Thomas as well transformed the entire print business over to Solomon. Now it's not unlikely that Solomon was already romantically involved with Sarah before Thomas died, which might explain why it was daughter number five who was left the printing business um, and the, um, the other daughters um, were left other property. Um, something we'll never know maybe, but either way, none of Anne's daughters became the legal owner of the printing business their parents had established. Not that is until Sarah found herself widowed in 1800. So it was 16 years after her father died that Sarah became the owner of what had been the Slack's business. If her husband had outlived her or even lasted long enough for one of their sons to come of age, then she would have been Thomas Slack's daughter, Solomon Hodgson's wife and the mother of her three surviving sons. Thomas, James, and John. As it was, she was Sarah Hodgson, printer and proprietor of the Newcastle Chronicle. Sarah continued to trade long after her sons joined the business. And yet she doesn't have her own entry, either in Welford's list of Newcastle printers or in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Instead, she only appears as an adjunct in her husband's entries in both of these records. Sarah was surely involved in print trade prior to 1800. She'd grown up around the business with a mother who was actively engaged in the trade. And in widowhood, Sarah proved herself more than capable of running the company. But unlike Anne, she left little evidence of her working life as a married woman. It was the circumstances of Anne Fisher's career, both before and after she became Mrs. Slack, that allow us to see what must have been commonplace, a married woman who worked in partnership with her husband. However, I think we need to be careful not to under overplay just how hands-on either of the Slacks might have been in their business. It's not clear if they ever lived above or next door to the printing press. But when Anne died in 1778, she was living in a more residential area of Newgate Street. And by this time, only could they afford portraits, um, but they employed foremen who presumably managed much of the day-to-day -day business. Um, and Slack and Co, even if the Slacks kept an active eye on proceedings, maybe even micromanaging particular projects, whilst presiding over the literary sociability in their shop. It's also important to remember that when the Slacks opened the printing press, they had six girls under 10 years of age. And when the Chronicle was launched the following year, there was another baby to care for. It therefore seems likely 
that they not only had to help running their business, but they also had domestic support in running their homes, underlying yet more in female labour that leaves no trace in the records. Finally, to sum it up, I think it's fair to say that Fisher didn't let her agenda hold her back. It did shape her working life, nonetheless. What's more, she had no wish to eradicate gender distinction. As the attempts to attract female readers to the Chronicle demonstrate, the slacks assumed that women and men had distinct tastes and would be drawn to the newspaper by different content. To argue that she added a feminine touch to running the printing press and to the output of Slack and Co is not to diminish the worth of her contribution. She evidently worked in partnership with her husband and played an equal role in their success. Theirs was a marriage made in print in which she achieved success as a woman, not in spite of being one. It's clear that she was not limited to the role of a sociable shopkeeper. Her input was practical, entrepreneurial, <coughs> financial, and intellectual. In other words, she was a very capable and successful businesswoman in her own right, not simply a husband's assistant. And yet, Anne's obituary in the Newcastle Chronicle, the paper she established with her husband, describes her as Mrs. Slack, wife of Mr. Slack, printer, before going on to say her character through life in her family as well as social connections is so well known as need not to be enlarged upon here. So even in death, and despite this assumed notability, there was no acknowledgement of her publications, let her alone, her involvement in the print territory. Instead, convention conspired with the laws of curvature to hide her achievements from the historical records. And I guess in many respects, it was this that made it feel particularly important to me to mark the tercentenary of her birth with a memorial plaque to set those records straight. It's cited on St. Jan's churchyard wall where her remains were laid to rest. And if you've not yet done so, do take time to stop and read it next time you pass. Thank you.